All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Anyone who is here live with us now, or if you're watching this at a later time, we want to welcome you to our weekly small groups and Bible study. Uh, this week, we are going over 2 Peter. We're reading the entire book of 2 Peter. It is three chapters, so that is what we're going to be going over. Um, the chapters cover basically increase in faith, um, false teachers, and um, those who would be scoffing in the last day. So I think tonight's uh, Bible study is going to be very good, very informative. We're going to learn a lot here. Uh, but before we get into it, let's go ahead and pray. So our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen, amen, and amen. All right. So Second Peter, we're going to kick it off with chapter one, Second Peter chapter one. And just again, for anyone that is in the call right now, um, if there's anything you like to say, anything you like to add to the teaching tonight, you're more than welcome to do so. You can raise your hand. You can turn on your mic. I will uh, call on you and I will address you. But without further more to say, we're going to go ahead and get right into it. So Second Peter chapter one, starting at verse one. Greetings from Peter. And for anybody following along, I am reading from the New Living uh, Translation. So this letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. This faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. Something I love about the introductions um, from the apostles, you know, whether it was uh Paul or Peter, you notice one thing, they they introduce themselves and then they bring their titles. So, you know, it, it just kind of tells you the purposes and then the title. Um, I love how Peter, he even puts he's a slave before he's an apostle. He said, I'm a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. So it shows humility. It shows how humble and how meek they are. So verse two, May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus, our Lord. Verse three, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have come receive, we have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance, and patient endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love for everyone. I want to break those past three, these last three scriptures we just read here. So verses uh, five through seven, so powerful, something that we all need to know, we need to keep in mind. Peter said, in view of all of this, Make every effort to respond to God's promises. You should put your absolute best effort in responding to the promises of God. You should do your absolute best to live for God. Notice it continue, continues on. It says, supplement your faith. Supplement your faith. Now, before he tells us what we, to, what we are to supplement our faith with, I love it because I think about guys who exercise or those who may take supplements, you know, uh, maybe they have a vitamin deficiency or whatever it may be. You know, when you exercise, when guys, uh, guys or girls, when they exercise in the gym, they may take a supplement. That supplement may be protein. It may be creatine, whatever it may be. They take a supplement, though, to grow stronger or maybe to be faster or to even increase their stamina. It's a supplement that increases their performance and enhances their performance. Same thing when you take a supplement, whether it's a vitamin, maybe you're someone like me who likes to take super beets or eat um, elderberries, 
their supplements that enhance your health, that improve your health. So here, Peter is telling us the supplements we are to have that will enhance our faith, that is good for our faith. So he says, supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. Key, number one um, supplement here is moral ex excellence. This is the first supplement he mentions here. Moral excellence. We are all called to live by holy standards. We are all called to live by God's word. We have morals that the world does not have. We see it a lot in our generation today. But when we keep these morals and we hold fast to these morals, this is supplementing our faith. This is saying like, God, we still have faith in you. We still trust in you. And we are not going to let go of our morals or even decrease our morals just because the culture's morals are changing or are, are not so high anymore. God's standards never change. His standards is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. So we are to live with a moral excellence. And then it says in moral excellence with knowledge, moral excellence with knowledge for anyone on this call tonight in our Bible study here, or even anyone who may be watching this via YouTube or Facebook, wherever you may be viewing it from. When you see knowledge here, you only increase in knowledge when you study the word of God. So you want to have moral excellence. You supplement your faith with one, keeping morals, and two, you have to be in the word of God. But then he goes on, and knowledge with self-control. Another key thing of supplementing your faith is with self-control. And as we go through 2 Peter tonight, this self that self-control piece is going to be discussed a little bit more in detail, but you want to have self-control. That means you can't be so easily angered. You can't be so easily offended. You can't be quick to, to curse someone. You, you know, you gotta, you gotta forgive over and over again. You gotta have self-control. Then he says, and self-control with patience endurance. I love how he says patient endurance, because sometimes some of us may have um, endurance, but we're impatient with it. So we may say, man, I know I'm in this storm. I know I'm in this trial. I know I have a ways to go, but now I am becoming impatient. Well, when you supplement, a supplement for your faith is patient endurance. And then he says impatient endurance with godliness. Godliness is like I said earlier, when you live holy, when you know, hey, I am filled with the Holy Spirit, and as a result, I am called to live holy. I am called to live according to the word of God. So patient endurance with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection. Are you affectionate to your brothers and sisters in Christ? Now, am I talking about intimacy here and uh, let's say a loving way? No, I am talking about, do you have compassion for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you care for those around you? Is your heart, do you express gratitude? Are you loving them? That is brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. So you take all of these supplements and it ultimately comes into your love for everyone, but all of these supplements, they all supplement your faith. And I love how Peter, he tied each and every one with one another. This is supplementing your faith. So the next time you say, I want to increase my faith or I want to enhance my faith, or maybe someone may ask you, how can I enhance my faith? Just like, how can I enhance my performance in the gym? Or how can I enhance my health? And you tell them, you got to have moral excellence. You got to have knowledge. You got to have self-control. You have to have patient endurance. You have to have godliness and you got to have brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. Those are all supplements for your faith. If we go to verse eight, the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love here how he said, the more you grow like this. So he had just finished telling us, Peter just finished telling us about the supplements for our faith. Now, when you take these supplements or when you use these supplements, you are growing. The key thing, when we are believers in Christ, as followers of Christ, we should always want to grow. You should never want to be stagnant. It's the same thing. I'm going to use the gym 
analogy again. It's what I relate to the most. But when it comes to the gym, if you see someone who is constantly going to the gym over and over and they're not growing, and I don't necessarily mean it doesn't mean they have to be getting, let's just say bigger, but let's say, you know, their stamina isn't increasing. Let's say their body doesn't look any different. Let's just say their mentality, because, you know, they say when you exercise, your mind even changes. Let's just say they don't grow and they remain the same. Then you have to ask yourself, what are you doing in the gym? Are you even being consistent? Are you truthfully going there and you're working out? Are you exercising? It's the same thing with our faith. You cannot have these supplements if you do not exercise your faith. So Peter said, the more you grow like this, meaning the more you grow in your faith, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There are a lot of people who are knowledgeable of the word of God, but they are not productive. They are not useful. You, it's, you know, it's just like having a doctor. You know, you can have a doctor out there. There are plenty of doctors out there who have medical degrees and they went through school and they did all of that. But guess what? They're not productive. They're not productive. They're not useful because they're not applying their knowledge. You want to apply your faith. You want to use your faith. But then he goes on here in verse nine. But those who fail to develop in this way are short sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins they forgot that they have been cleansed from their old sins again the key thing is develop there so as a believer in christ are you developing are you growing it's just like crystal and i we have two children two children as most of you may know already solomon and mia every time we take solomon and mia to the doctor they have milestones set for children and there are milestones that babies should be meeting does it mean they'll be a hundred percent every single time no. Does it mean if they don't hit a certain milestone, something is wrong? No. But there are milestones that they put for children to see, are they growing the way they should be growing? And it's the same thing as a believer. We have milestones. We should be growing. Now, does this mean if you don't have, if you don't hit a specific milestone by the time you're 26 or by the time you're 30 or 40 or 50 or 15, whatever it may be, doesn't mean you're going to hell and doesn't mean you're not saved. No, but there are milestones that are set in place showing that we are growing. But some people, they're stagnant in life. They're stagnant in their walk with God and they do not grow. If we go to verse 10, so dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you are really among, you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. It, it takes hard work to prove that we are saved. It takes hard work to prove that we are followers of Christ. A lot of times it requires a sacrifice. You may have to sacrifice your time. You may have to sacrifice uh, some of the things you enjoy doing sometimes. You know, you, you may say, hey, I need to do this. I need to serve the poor. I need to feed those who, are, who may be homeless. I want to provide clothes for them. I want to go here and do this. I want to go here and do that. You know, a lot of people, they'll look at a believer and the thing that they'll hold you to, the scale they'll hold you to is, what have you done? You sit here and talk Bible, you preach Bible, but what have you done with the knowledge you have? What have you done with that faith? You're telling me God gave you all of this faith, but you have yet to use it? It takes hard work to prove that you really are called and chosen. Like he said, you do these things and you will never fall away, which tells me for those who are lazy, for those who who don't supplement their faith it's only a matter of time if they haven't already when they'll fall away and that's a dangerous place to be in verse 11 says then god will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our lord and savior jesus christ a grand entrance we should all want a grand entrance imagine Imagine you get to heaven and God says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You may come in and the angels are just a little bit quiet. There's no music. There's no rejoicing. There's none of that. All of us should want that grand entrance that Peter talks about here. You should want to see the angels rejoicing. You should want to see other believers, other brothers and sisters who made it into the kingdom. You should want to see them rejoicing that you made it in. 
you want a grand entrance. This is, this, you know, this grand entrance, it's, it's incomparable to the red carpet that we see here on earth. It's incomparable to maybe rewards or awards that you may receive in school or from some athletic event. This grand entrance is eternal. This grand entrance is something that no man can describe. And this is what we are striving for, that grand entrance into the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, therefore, I will always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth you have been taught. And it is only right that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live for our Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life. So I will work hard to make sure you are always you always remember these things after I am gone. It's no different than what I'm doing here today. I will work hard from this day and every day and every day, every week and every month. I work hard to ensure that you all remember the things that are taught. You all remember the word of God. It's important that we as believers, we work hard at it because we want it to stick with people's minds. I think about teachers, whether you're a kindergarten teacher, a teacher, you know, an elementary school, middle school, high school, a professor in college, whatever. You work hard to study the material that you are teaching because really your, your, your goal is for your students to retain it. You want them to retain it so that they can recall it. And that is how we as believers should, should walk. We should be in our word enough to the point where we retain it so that when things come up in life, we can recall it and therefore um, and therefore apply it. That's the key thing there. But a lot of people today, they don't retain it. They just say, oh, I read my three verses today or, oh, I read my three chapters today. So what? I'm going on with the rest of my day. They don't care about retaining it. And it doesn't mean you'll memorize every scripture by heart. It doesn't mean that you'll know the Bible like the back of your hand. But the thing is, you should it, it, it should be filling you so much that when something does arise in your life, it's retained in you. Even if you don't know how it was retained, it's retained in you and you're able to recall it. For we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This isn't no fairy tale, fairy tale. All of us on this call today and anyone watching this, the Bible is not a fairy tale. The gospel is not a fairy tale. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes when he received honor and glory from God the Father. The voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. We ourselves have heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. You must pay close attention to what they wrote. I love it here. He says, you must pay close attention to what they wrote because Peter knew, just as I know, and just as some of you on this call today know, or some of you watching this later on may know, some people skim through the books of the prophets. They skim through Isaiah. They skim through uh, uh, Jeremiah. They skim through Hosea. They skim through Ezekiel. They deem these books not important, but these books hold great value. They tell us a lot about what is to come. Peter said, pay close attention to what they wrote. For their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and Christ the morning star shines in your hearts. Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. So the key thing I heard a pastor recently, um, actually his name is Pastor Tyler Butler a great man of God. He said recently, it's always a dangerous thing when you're under a teacher, you know, you're under a pastor, apostle, a prophet, or whoever. They teach a whole sermon with very little Bible. It's more of their words and less of God's word. You want to ensure that, hey, when I'm teaching, even like today, when I'm teaching, we are going off the word of God. This isn't Cameron Bracey's words. This isn't Crystal Bracey's words. This isn't Aaliyah Lopez's words or Amanda Ellis's words. This is the word of God. And that is how you should be when you are listening to other teachers. It doesn't matter who it is. Are they teaching from the word of God or are they giving you more of a motivational speech for that's coming from their own tongue and not from the word of God? So that is chapter one of Second Peter. Before we go on to chapter two, does anybody have any questions or anything they would like to add to that?
If not, all right. Uh, Second Peter chapter two. I think this is the one that's going to get everybody because this is a very popular topic today and something that a lot of people um, don't talk about, honestly. So Second Peter chapter two starts off with the danger of false teachers, the danger of false teachers, something we need to be mindful of today. So Peter said, but there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. He's already starting verse one so heavy, like my, uh, like my brother Christian said. It's so good. It is so good. He lets us know already there were false prophets in Israel and there will be false teachers among you. We have to remember that just because we're in 2023, and just because everybody has access to a Bible or just because a lot of people know how to read or a lot of people may have resources, there will be false teachers amongst you. There's false teachers amongst us everywhere. And I love how he also says here, they will cleverly teach destructive heresies. See, a lot of believers, they think a destructive heresy is going to be so easily noticed. It's going to be so easy to hear. It's going to be so easy to understand. But you have to remember Satan masquerades himself as an angel of light. So if he masquerades himself as an angel of light, don't you think that those who are being used by him, they will know how to cleverly say certain things. They may tie a little scripture in here, here with it, but they will manipulate what scripture is saying to make you and to, to, to have you interpret it another way, a certain way. They will cleverly teach it. These aren't fools up here teaching. They know exactly. Now, they're foolish in the way that they're living. I will say that. Yes, they are. But they know what their intent is. They know exactly what their motive is and what, their, um, what, what they want the outcome to be, which we're going to talk about here a little late, later. So they even deny the master who bought them. False teachers aren't going to stand up in front of you and say they don't believe in Jesus Christ. False teachers aren't going to stand up in front of you and they're not going to say they don't believe in the word of God. That's not clever. But in their hearts, in their minds, I'm even going to say privately, and by the way they walk, they will deny Jesus Christ. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on them. Selves. You and I don't need to bring destruction to them. You and I don't need to cause any harm to them because just by their heresies, they are bringing destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. That's such a key thing that we need to pay attention there to. Many will follow their evil teaching. This is not something where, oh, if it's a false teacher, they must have a little audience. They must have a little church. They must have a little crowd. They have very few subscribers or they have very, very few people who follow them on Instagram or on Facebook. It's actually the opposite. A lot of false teachers actually have some of the greatest followings than some of those who tell the truth, than those who preach the word of God. The Bible says many will follow not only their evil teaching, but their shameful immorality. So they will not only have their ears tickled, but they also will live a way that is not pleasing to God because the teacher said, God understands why you did that. God understands why you decided to curse this person out. God understands why you, why you didn't forgive this individual. God understands this. It's a false teaching and they say it cleverly i'm not saying cleverly because that's not me clearly but they say it cleverly to the point where you actually begin to believe it and because of these teachers the way of truth will be slandered the way of truth will be slandered i think something we had a a friend over earlier today and something that we all agreed on when we were discussing was you know Everybody says, oh, it's demonic for those individuals who are talking against the prosperity gospel. But then you also have another group who is saying it's demonic for those who are speaking against the poverty gospel. And the truth is, there's only one gospel, and that is the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So there is no poverty gospel, and there is no prosperity gospel. There is only one gospel, and that is the gospel that we read in the Bible. That is the gospels you hear about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That is what it is. But some of these false teachers, they will slander the gospel to make it appear the way that they want it to appear, to make it appealing to you, to 
motivate you to live a way again or read the Bible or understand the Bible in a way that it was not correct or it, it, its intent, the context. They took it all out of order. They slandered it. Verse three, in their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. But God condemned them long ago and their destruction will not be delayed. In their greed, false teachers are greedy. It's a characteristic. So when someone says, how can you identify a false teacher? Number one, they may actually very well be very clever with what they say. They know how to say it, when to say it, and they, got, they always have the perfect response. Number two, pay very close attention. Does it mean that every person who has a large following is evil? No, that is not what I'm saying here today. Jesus had a, you know, the Bible tells us how multitudes followed him to, to be healed and to be delivered. But pay close attention to how many follow them. Not just how many follow them, I should say, but who is following them? Who is attracted to them? Is the world attracted to them? Why is the world attracted to them? Why does the world love everything they say? Because if they are preaching the word of God, Jesus says you will be persecuted for my name's sake. So who is following them? And how does the world receive them? Because it's just, we're just going to be honest here. If you are preaching a false heresy, if you're teaching a heresy, the world is going to receive you well. But if you're teaching the word, the word of God, at some point in time, the world is going to hate you. The world is going to speak against you. It's the truth. I'm actually going to give you all an example here. I had a video on YouTube that um, where I talked about hell. I said, hell is eternal torment. It is eternal torment. Let me just read a couple of comments for you all that some of the people say. Some, somebody said, wait, this dude thinks hell is an actual destination. That's what they said. They said, this dude thinks hell is an actual destination. Somebody else said, this guy needs to get an education. Somebody else said, I'm foolish. Somebody else said, I'm having mental delusions. This is what is said about people who teach the word of God. Now, some may say, camera, does it bother you? Camera, does it get to you? Absolutely not, because it comes with the territory. It comes with the walk. It comes with the calling. I expect people to respond this way when I tell the truth, when I teach the truth. It comes with the territory. It's part of the walk. So that's something that we have to pay close attention to here too, is how is the world receiving them? How are they receiving them? And number three, a false teacher is usually greedy. And every single one of their messages and every single sermon and every single day, they have to somehow bring money into scripture. There are so many scriptures that have nothing to do with money, but a false teacher will manipulate the scripture to turn it into how it's about money and how it's about how you can bless their ministry and how you can always give to them and how God wants you to do this. It is false teaching. This is why you have to read the word of God for yourself. They will come up with clever lies to get hold of your money. And a lot of false teachers won't even tell you, they won't even read certain books in the Bible to you because they know if they read it, it will expose them. You won't see a false teacher more than likely teaching on 2 Peter 2. You won't hear a false teacher, or I'm going to say a wolf who is in sheep clothing, teach about wolves in sheep clothing. You won't hear another teacher who is greedy talk about the dangers of greed or the dangers of the love of money because they themselves love money. They're not going to want to expose themselves. They're not going to want to tell on themselves. And I even tell, I tell Crystal this, my wife all the time. I say, you know, the Bible tells us that there are plenty of wolves in sheep clothing. One characteristic, as we all know, anybody who's, who uh, just knows anything about wolves, or if you're like me and like to look at animal planet, sometimes wolves always hang out in packs. So you can identify nine times out of 10, a wolf in sheep clothing by who they're hanging out with, who's part of their pack. That's how you identify one. But let's keep going here. But God condemned them long ago and their destruction will not be delayed. So we may say, how much longer is God going to allow this heresy or this teaching to go on? God has already condemned them. Their judgment is already near. It will not be delayed. For God did not even spare the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell 
in gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held unto the day of judgment. I wish some of those people who are commenting under my YouTube, even at this moment as I receive notifications, I wish they would read that they would be sitting here listening. Hell is a real place. Fallen angels are real. Demons are real. Verse five, and God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven other family, seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. We live in a time, we live in a generation, and you know, everything under the sun repeats itself. Nothing is new. The Bible tells us that in Ecclesiastes. Nothing is new under the sun. We have to remember, we have to encourage the world. We have to really preach repentance to the world because the world thinks because God already did one flood and because Jesus died on the cross for our sins, they think there will no longer be a judgment. But you have to remember, he, Jesus did not die on the cross for you to still live foolishly, for you to live however you want. Yes, you must repent. You must ask for forgiveness of your sins, but repentance is turning away from your sins to God. Judgment is still real. Judgment will take place. And a lot of people, even as we speak on this small group Bible study tonight, as you sit in your room watching this, or you're in the car listening to this, or wherever you may be viewing this, you have to remember that there is somebody right now at this exact second who is being judged by God. There is somebody who was who had just died in the hospital. There may be another who was shot and killed on the street. There may be another who overdosed, whether it was with drugs or with alcohol. There's another where something happened to them or unexpectedly died. And right now they are being judged right before God. They are either hearing, well done, my good and faithful servant. And they're being, they're, they're entering that grand entrance that we talked about in, in, in uh, chapter one, or they're hearing, away from me, I never knew you. And now they're being thrown into eternal torment where the demons and the fallen angels are waiting to torture them for an eternity. We always have to keep that in mind. At this exact second, somebody is being judged. Millions are being judged. Verse seven, but God also rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man who was sick of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around him. I don't know about you, but I'm sick of the wickedness that I see right now in the United States. I'm sick of the wickedness that I see in Asia. I'm sick of the wickedness that I see in China, that I see in Russia. I'm sick of it. Just as, uh, just as Lot was sick of it, so should you. If you're a follower of Christ, if you're, if you're a believer in God, the, the, the immorality and all of this pride and all of the evil, the murder, the, the, the trafficking and all of it, you should be sick of it. You should be sick of it. Notice here the Bible says Lot was sick of it and God rescued him as a result. If you are truly on fire for God, you should be sick of it. And a lot of Christians will say, well, tolerate it. No, I'm gonna preach repentance. I'm gonna preach the gospel. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, but I'm sick of the foolishness. You should be sick of it. Verse eight says, yes, forgive me here, my phone glitched. Here we go. Yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day after day. Just like us, we see the wickedness day after day. So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of final judgment. This is something about this world, about this generation, about people who think they can do whatever they want. And when they die, they're going to be resting in peace. God has them already under punishment. There's a punishment awaiting for them. If they do not repent, they will be in that punishment for an eternity. So verse 10 here, he is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and who despise authority. Their own twisted sexual desire and despise authority authority. God is hard on you. The Bible talks about how, the, you know, 
sexual sins are different from other sins because in a sexual sin, you are committing a sin against your very own self. And those who despise authority, if you despise authority, you won't be submitted unto Jesus. A lot of people who despise authority, they can't really follow Jesus. They don't really love the word of God. They don't want to submit to the word of God because they can't even submit to their boss. They can't submit to their to their uh, spiritual leader. They won't submit to anyone else. And they think, well, I don't have to submit to anyone else, but I do submit to God. There's order. You have to know how to submit to authority. There's order to it. These people are proud and arrogant, daring even to scoff at supernatural beings without so much as trembling. I remember Pastor Jensen Franklin. He said, you know, it's one thing to me in a season of sin and you're making mistakes, you know, and you have that conviction that tells you right there the Holy Spirit is still within you. The Holy Spirit is still alive within you. But when you lose that conviction, you are in a dangerous place. And right here, it says these people who are proud and arrogant, they scoff at supernatural beings without so much as trembling. When you sin, there should be a tremble in you. When you sin, you shouldn't feel easy. You should be at dis-ease. You should feel conviction. That tells you the Holy Spirit is still alive in you. You are still filled with the Holy Spirit. But the angels who are far greater in power and strength these angels, these supernatural beings, they're, the Bible says they're far greater in power and strength. You and I are nothing to them. Do not dare, they do not dare to bring from the Lord a charge of blasphemy against those supernatural beings. These false teachers, still talking about false teachers here, are like unthinking animals, creatures of instinct. They, 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 they move by how they feel born to be caught and destroyed. They scoff at things they do not understand and like animals, they will be destroyed. A false teacher will scoff at scriptures that talks about them, that describes them, that exposes them. They, they speak against scriptures. They'll say, well, I don't necessarily understand that. So I'm not ever going to speak about it. And as a result, my congregation is never going to hear about it. If you don't understand it, if you don't know it, this is when you invite someone else who is knowledgeable in that area of study. So when, and like animals, they will be destroyed. Their destruction is their reward for the harm they have done. They love to indulge in evil pleasures in broad daylight. This is the thing. They're greedy. And a lot of false teachers, they're going to show you in broad daylight what they got as a result of their greed. They're going to show you the cars, the, the planes. They're going to show you all these homes and all these vacations they take and everything. And a lot of believers will think, oh, look at how blessed they are. And oh, look at all that God is doing in them. But you don't even know that they're showing you how they're indulging in evil pleasures in broad daylight. They're showing you their greed. They are a disgrace and a stain among you. They delight in deception, even as they eat with you in your fellowship meals. Meaning it doesn't matter the title you may have in a church. There may be a false teacher among you and they sitting right there next to you taking communion. They sitting right there with you at the restaurant. They're coming right there with you at your party, sitting with your home. They sit right next to you. And they're, they delight in the deception. They will continue to talk about money and money and money and all of these fleshly things. Here goes some more about false teachers. Verse 14, they commit adultery with their eyes and their desire for sin is never satisfied. A false teacher is always looking at, the, at, at another woman or she is always looking at another man or maybe they're looking at the same sex. They're always looking, they're committing adultery. Instead of keeping their eyes on God and their eyes on their spouse, they're looking at everything and everybody else. They lure unstable people into sin and they are well-trained in greed. They live under God's curse. We need to stop looking at these high profile lives or these luxurious lives as always being blessed. There are a lot of people, even in the Bible, who we would have deemed as blessed today because of the palace they lived in or because of the carriages they rolled around in when really they were under a curse by God. Satan's blessings are really 
a curse. He's keeping you. It's a stronghold. He's keeping you in bondage. And a lot of people, their money keeps them in bondage. I love here how he also said they lure unstable people into sin and they are well-trained in greed. Anyone who studies the word of God, anyone who is um, uh, well-versed, I would like to say, in the word of God, you can walk into an atmosphere and you should be immediately, you should be able to discern this is false teaching. This is deceptive teaching. And false teachers, they know, they know who, who to target. They know who is easiest, those who are not well-versed those who don't read their Bible, and those who are brand new to the walk of Christ. They may be recently saved, recently converted, and they say, that's one I can target. They target the little children. They take advantage of the little children, just like pedophiles. What do they do? They take advantage of those who don't have the strength to fight for themselves or who don't know any better. And it's the same thing with the false teacher. They take advantage of those who don't know the word of God. And as a result, they're not equipped with the armor of God. And they take advantage of those who are weaker than their other brothers and sisters in Christ. They have wandered off the road. So false teacher still. They have wandered off the road, off the right road and followed the footsteps of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved to earn money by doing wrong. But Balaam was stopped from his mad course when his donkey rebuked him with a human voice. These people, Peter is going in on false teachers. These people are as useless as dried up springs or as mist blown away by the wind. They are doomed to blackest darkness. They bring about themselves with empty foolish or with empty foolish boasting, meaning a false teacher will always talk about themselves. Everything they say is about them. Everything that goes on in the church or in the organization, it's all about them. Everything that goes on revolves around them. That's a characteristic of a false teacher. That's a dangerous way. They have an appeal to twisted sexual desires. They lure back into sin those who have barely escaped from a lifestyle of deception. Like I said, they, they pick on, they target those who are, as we would like to say, new converts. They just started following Christ. They're still babes in Christ. They're, they're still on milk. That is who they target. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slave of sin and corruption. This sounds like they promise everyone they're going to be multimillionaires. They promise everyone they're going to live in multi-million dollar homes. They promise everyone they're going to have a luxurious car and luxurious, love style, luxurious lifestyles when they themselves are slaves of their greed. For you are a slave to whatever controls you. Their money controls them. Their greed controls them. Their sexual desires control them. And when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and then get tangled up and enslaved by sin, they are worse off than before. Remember, Jesus had talked about how when one is when a demon is casted out of one, that demon will go out looking everywhere else. It will be seeking and it doesn't seek. It's, it's seeking another host and it can't find anyone else. So what does that evil spirit do? It gets seven other evil spirits. This is what Jesus said. And it comes back to the host that it was that it was cast out of because the host is empty. See, we're so quick. It's 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 a blessing. Yes, we are called Jesus. Jesus' ministry. A lot of it was deliverance. A lot of it was casting out demons. But when you cast out a demon out of somebody, you, the next thing is you want to be sure that they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Demons will return to a host that is empty. So if you know someone who says, oh, I've been delivered from fornication, I've been delivered from alcohol, but are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Have you surrendered your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength to God? Because if you just say, I'm done doing these things, but I want nothing to do with God, you are now still available to the kingdom of darkness. You are now still making yourself, uh, I would say, a victim to Satan and his demons. You want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Casting out a demon, deliverance is not the end. So if you don't, if you say, you may say, I'm done with fornication. Good, that's great. God wants you to be done with fornication. He wants you to be delivered from that. But you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit because you may stop having sex with this one dude, but if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to start having sex with another man or another woman who was not your wife or husband. 
You have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So it would be better if they had never known the way to righteousness than to know it and then reject the command they were given to live a holy life. It sounds like Judas to me. Remember, Jesus said it would have been better if this man was never born. It would have been better if he was never born. They proved the truth of this proverb. A dog returns to its vomit. And another says a washed pig returns to the mud. False teachers are always going to go back to their evil, deceptive, greedy ways. They're gonna go back to those sexual desires. They're gonna run back to the money. We just identified and talked about false teachers. Does anybody have any questions, any comments? Anything you learned or read, any revelation that God gave you before we go into the final chapter of Second Peter? Going once, going twice. If not, all right, I'll keep going forward. Chapter three, chapter three, talking about the day of the Lord is coming, about the end times, the last days. This is the final chapter of Second Peter. Peter said, this is my second letter to you, dear friends. And in both of them, I have tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember what the holy prophet said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. Remember, I just told you all I'm being mocked on YouTube right now for saying that hell is eternal torment. It's not a place where you can just party, party, and party. Hell is eternal torment. People, scoffers will mock the truth. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. Do we not hear that today? Anyone, any believer who knows, you, you see the signs of the times. We are truly in the end times. We're in those days, y'all. But when you come out and say that, whether it's me, it can be Christian, it can be Crystal, people will mock you. And they will say, I remember my grandmother used to say that. She said her grandmother said that. And my, my great-great-grandmother said her great-great-grandfather said that. And Jesus still ain't come back. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do whatever I want. And maybe I'll give my life to him when I'm 60 or 70. Maybe I'll start taking my walk with Christ seriously when I'm 40 or 50. Tomorrow is never promised. Tomorrow is never promised. Your life is a vapor. So they mock the return of Jesus Christ. They scoff at it. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command. And he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. No man can do this. This is only God. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. Notice here, he said in verse seven, and by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. Remember, Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will never pass away. We all hear about climate change. We all hear about all of the increase in violence. We hear about the uh, unstable economy. Recently, we all know about all of this weather, this hot weather that Texas and Arizona and California, what they're all facing. We hear about all of these wildfires taking place in California, taking place in Canada. We hear them taking place all over the world. Guess what, y'all? God has only given people a glimpse of what is to come in the future. It's only a glimpse. It's a small glimpse of what is to come. But what do people do? They scoff at it. They say, it's just climate change. Our scientists will figure out how to fix it. And they say, oh, it's just the sun caught a tree on fire or maybe some, some bushes got too hot and caught fire. Our firefighters will pull it, put, put it out. Um, our government will send planes to pour chemicals over it and it will all be taken care of. God is showing a glimpse of the world, or is showing a glimpse to the world of what is to come. And they still scoff at it. They still mock him. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day, is, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise. 
as some people think. Scoffers and mockers and those believers who fall away, they think they have all the time in the world. They think God is being slow. They think he's being a turtle. Some people think, no, he is being patient for your sake. It's no different than a parent when they have to discipline, when, when, when they're going to discipline a child. A parent, a loving parent, may allow their child to mess up, let's say two or three times. I'll just, you know, we'll say three times, you strike out. They'll allow them, hey, I told you not to touch, I told you not to touch the stove, don't touch it. They may say it a second time, raise their voice a little bit. I told you not to touch the stove, don't touch it. Child does it again. I told you not to touch the stove. So the parent now is raising their voice. Don't touch it. Now that child may think that the parent is just being slow, that the parent is not going to do anything, but the, the, the trait that that parent has is patience for the child's sake, because the parent knows if you keep doing it, I'm going to whoop you. You're going to be disciplined. It's the same thing with God. He's being patient for our sakes. As for myself, as for everyone on this call and everyone who is watching this teaching later on, we all have loved ones. We know who may be lukewarm, or we know who may not be living the way they should be living. We have friends who may be in the midst of fornication. We have friends who may have lukewarm hearts or their hearts are cold to God. We need to thank God for being patient because he can come back at this moment and some people have children, some people have sons, some people have daughters who are not living the way they should be living. And if God were to return today, they will be left, uh, left behind, possibly on the way to hell. God is being patient for the sake of those who are still, we'll say, lukewarm. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. So this belief from the world where why would a loving God send people to hell? God wants us to be destroyed. I hear so much scoffing today at when God first first wiped out, you know, he, he, he basically, he sent the flood and everything. And people say, why would you create man just to destroy them with water? Y'all, his word says he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. But if you choose not to repent, you're choosing to reject God. And if you choose to reject God, you will be destroyed. You will suffer for an eternity. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. This is something that your ring camera can't warn you about. This is something that your ADT alarm system can't warn you about or whatever security system you may have. It can't warn you about when the Lord is coming. It's gonna be unexpected. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise. And the very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. God destroyed the earth once with water. The second time it will be with fire. Fire. The first time people drowned. The second time people will burn alive. Verse 11, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. You should live. I can't force you to live a godly life. I can't force you to live a holy life. But I will say you should live a holy life, a godly life. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements uh, will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth. He has promised a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. Meaning, don't just sit around and do nothing. Don't just sit around looking at the sky saying, oh, is Jesus going to come back today? Oh, are the trumpets going are, are to trumpets gonna blow today? Keep busy. Forgive those who may have offended you. Find peace with those who you may not be at peace with. Live blameless lives. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him. That's right, Christian. Occupy until he comes. That's right. That's absolutely right. Speaking of these things in all of his letters, some of his comments are hard to understand. And those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different, just as they do with other parts of scripture. We just talked about false teachers. They will twist 
a scripture. They will manipulate it. They will take it out of its context to apply to what they want it to mean. And this will result in their destruction. Peter's final words. You already know these things, dear friends. So be on guard. Then you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace the knowledge of our Lord and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All glory to him, both now and forever. Amen. Amen and amen. Y'all, we got through first Peter and second Peter. We got through Peter's letters. Does anybody have any comments on chapter three? Maybe any of the chapters. Maybe there's something you wanted to say and I kept going and you didn't have opportunity to. Anything. Time is now. Time is now. We got through all of it. All right. If not, um, we got through Second Peter. Um, if there is another book that anyone would like to go over, or maybe if not a whole book, I get every book in the Bible. We can't get through the whole thing. You know, it's just probably not going to happen. But um, maybe there's a specific chapter in a book that you would like to go over. You can say it out loud right now. You can submit it in the comments. Um, if not, I can just make an announcement next week as to what book uh, or what chapter, what scripture we may go into. Uh, Mom, thank you. I know she mentioned the book of Revelation. Yeah. Go ahead, Christian. Um, <clears throat> well, I just wanted to first start off by just say you did a phenomenal job of teaching both first and second Peter. I loved the way how God used you to deliver his word up unto us. Um, secondly, it's, it's, it's not a coincidence that you're teaching this right now in the season that we're about to enter into next month, because um, I was going to say this earlier, but I just, you know, waited until afterwards, you know, we're approaching the season in which God is going to make his great return. And, you know, when you, when you, when you read the Bible, you know, you have to understand that, like you were saying earlier, God never deviates and the seasons never deviate as well. There's three seasons that we live in, you know, atonement, Pentecost, pass, or excuse me, Passover, Pentecost, atonement. We are about to step into the atonement season next month on Monday, September 25th. That's the season in which God says, I will make my great return. Doesn't mean he's coming back. And this doesn't mean he's coming back this year, next year, five years from now, 10 years from now. That, that, is, that doesn't mean that. But like you said earlier, and I truly do believe this with everything that's going on in the world, because the Bible is the Bible is being fulfilled right in front of our eyes and people are still blind to this day. But I truly do believe that God's return is coming sooner than later. I truly do believe it because, you know, like the Bible talks about right before he comes back, right before he comes back. He's going to outpour his spirit. He's going to pour out his spirit amongst his sons and daughters. That's what Joel chapter two says. And Acts, and Acts chapter two, verse 17 says as well. So my encouragement to you all is over the next couple, I guess you could say almost two months or whatever till September 25th, wake up. If you haven't been awoke, get, awake. Awake, because once September 25th comes, that's when God opens up the books, the Lamb's book of life. If your name is not found in it and he makes his great return, it's over with. So I just encourage you all to wake up, preach, preach, preach the word, never be ashamed. You know, like the Bible tells, like Paul tells us, we don't know the day, day or the hour, but we know the season and we're approaching that season. So just stay awake and continue to, you know, minister unto people and let God use you in this season before we step into the season in which he makes his great return. And don't fall away. The Bible talks about right before he comes back, many shall fall away. Don't fall away. Do not fall away. I don't care how hard life gets. I don't care what you're going through. Don't fall away. Jesus never fell away from you, so don't fall away from him. Amen. 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 Well received. Amen. All right. Well received from Brother Christian. Um, just once again, does anybody have any requests on books they may want to go over? Anything on record? It's all on record. It's going to be recorded. If not, um, I will pray about and seek God about what the next thing we may go over. I have a few written down. Um, at least some are chapters. 
in my phone here, but I'll pray and see God about it. But if you have any requests, books that you would like to go over, or if you're watching this later on and there's maybe a specific chapter from any book that you want um, you want us to dive into or even explain, um, you can comment um, below, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook or anybody who has my number, or you can email it wherever all the information is there. You can definitely let me know. But if there is nothing else that anybody would like to add or has to say, I just, I just want to say that um, everybody have a blessed and safe weekend. I'm proud of each and every one of you. We got through all of Peter, all of Peter. So I'm excited. We got through all of Peter, both first and second Peter. Got through it in three weeks. So it doesn't take a long time to go through Peter. Peter is very short um, chapters. Mom, I did see your request about the book of Revelation. Um, but, uh, you know, you chose Peter. So I want to give other people an opportunity to... <laughs> <laughs> I will give people another opportunity to also choose. I saw you. So yeah. Uh, but all right. All right, y'all. So we will see y'all next Friday at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. Y'all be blessed. <laughs>